Hi, and welcome to uh, this Rule of Carnage review for Broadside. Um, so I featured Broadside's um, current uh, Kickstarter for their expansion, Liberté, uh, that's running on Kickstarter right now. And uh, the creator, Ben Wynn, reached out to me uh, to maybe do a little interview. Um, so I decided that uh, I'd read through the rules, um, do a little bit of review, and then we've recorded a little interview uh, segment back and forth that will be uh, after the review. So um, you'll not just get to hear my viewpoint on the game, but also uh, the creator, which uh, hopefully is fun. So um, first of all, we'll launch straight in with the standard review. So Broadside Empires of Steel is a Great War era dreadnought based game. Um, so it's a naval based game, um, which I think opens up a lot of really interesting uh, design considerations, which I'll talk about a little bit later in the in the video. Um, so basically, um, each side picks a small part of a fleet um, for a at sea meeting engagement. Um, the game moves very fast, it's very tactical, got some really interesting uh, strategic uh, mechanics, again, that I'll talk about in a second. Um, it has, um, obviously, inertia-based movement, um, large ships being tricky to sort of slow down and speed up. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's full of interesting tactical choices, um, fast-moving gameplay, um, you know, all the things that we sort of uh, love to see in a skirmish miniatures game. But um, sometimes I think some naval games can be a bit slow. Um, certainly modern uh, naval based games uh, can be a niche of a niche because of the, the nature of naval engagements. Broadside keeps, I think, the uh, historic flavour of those sorts of games. Um, and I think they've picked the, uh, the, the specific era of the Great Dreadnoughts uh, really smartly. I think it's a really good idea. Um, it keeps the the sort of the historic reality of a lot of the pieces, but um, makes it work in a gameplay setting. So uh, in relation that, to that, I'm just going to have uh, a quick chat about uh, some of my favourite mechanics in the game uh, in the So I'd like to take a second to focus in on um, three mechanics specifically in the game that I think are, are super cool and super smart. Talk those through before going on to the interview with Ben. Um, so first of all, uh, the way that the game uses orders I think is uh, super interesting and really cool. So um, basically uh, each ship can activate normally and has its sort of standard stats and abilities. But you can place orders on ships that significantly increase their their capabilities for the turn. Uh, movement, combat, um, even recovery and repair can be improved. But, and this is I think what's really interesting about the game, is that um, if your ship gets uh, targeted um, and, and hit sort of during the turn, you have to take a test in order to activate the order, whereas if it doesn't, you get to order that, uh, activate that order freely. So that gives a really, I think, interesting sort of tactical element to the the, the sort of the the order in which you activate your orders <laughs> uh, or at least the, the 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 sort of the order in which you activate your ships which ships you target um, why and how sort of um, you know obviously trying to make it more difficult for less disciplined ship to be able to activate their orders um, early on it, it is a really sort of interesting sort of tactical ex exchange and and a sort of a really fantastic little puzzle there that's been sort of dropped in by a, a really actually very simple sort of uh, set of mechanics. You know, we, we often expect to take tests to activate orders. Um, you know, so at the start of the turn, you, you lay out your orders, uh, order cards around your ships, and then you activate in turn and targeting ships with orders, um, ideally sort of activating ships with orders earlier on, or maybe less disciplined ships that will struggle more if they don't have their orders. Um, sort of free to activate it just it creates so many sort of clever little sort of interactive puzzles within the game which I absolutely love you know the more of that um, absolutely the better um, 
The second mechanic I really enjoy uh, in the game is um, the way that shooting works specifically. There's a, a really clever sort of um, fail forward mechanic in the shooting. So if you target a ship and miss, you, you fail to hit them, you drop uh, a sort of a, an aiming ranging token on them. So obviously if you've if you've fired a shot and it's missed and you've, you've seen where it's gone down, you can be able to range in your next shot that much more effectively. Um, so it gives you something even when you sort of totally fail and, and miss a shot. It sort of, it gives you opportunity to sort of think ahead, plan out your shooting, and it means you're sort of you're never getting absolutely nothing for a miss and the game sort of always progressing forwards always moving towards a conclusion which absolutely i think are mechanics that you really want to see in a game um the third mechanic and to be fair there are there are so many smart mechanics in here i'll just do a quick roundup of some of the the more minor ones um you know uh damage being represented by damage cards which i think is always a really nice mechanic to sort of give a bit of variation to the shots um also uh the the movement system as say the the inertial movement system where you could accelerate or decelerate each turn but only to a certain degree so if you do sort of fail to forward plan and, and you don't get the right orders in time you can find yourself sort of heading off into into open water and losing a ship which is really smart and again encourages you to to, to put in forward planning and thinking through your orders and thinking through your choices um but the the last sort of mechanic that, that i really enjoy about it and this is something that you know you could probably imagine um i, I would like from sort of looking at something like Hobgoblin is that you only remove ships at the end of a turn irrespective of how much damage they've suffered um, how bad their, their flooding is any of those sorts of elements so you can't get sort of instantly alpha striked out of a game and again it mixes up those strategic choices it mixes up those tactical options where you're like okay well this ship is going down you know I know I'm losing at the end of the turn what can I do with it before it goes down does that change how I operate with it does it change how I sort of try and activated it um, you know when I'm putting out orders am I going to put in a recover order on that sort of badly damaged ship I'm fairly sure that it's going to sort of take damage before I can activate that that recovery element so do I just sort of go in full full uh, attack or do I risk it in the hope that I'll manage to sort of get some repairs in bit before it gets taken down I think it's you know a really simple mechanic that I think um ups a lot of the gameplay value and it increases the chances of you just always being able to do something interesting with a ship you're never going to sort of um lose out on an activation um because it's been alpha striked out really great ideas lovely mechanics sort of throughout the game um i think it's really interesting as i say i i feel like naval battles can be a a bit of a niche um and i think that a lot of people have been put off them by quite how um sort of slow some of the the previous systems can be and i could say they, they they have in the past been a bit of a niche of a niche the sort of naval war gamer but i strongly suggest taking a look um at broadsides it's got a real speed to it it's it's been intelligently sort of gamified i know that some people aren't sort of super happy about that term but it's been it, it, it's been gamified in such a smart way it's it's been made so much more tactically and intelligent on the tabletop that if you haven't tried out naval gaming um you know or, or you 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 sort of have been put off in the past i strongly suggest picking up and giving it a look obviously there'll be a link through to the kickstarter um uh within the comments for this uh video um so now we're going to go on to the Okay, uh, so uh, Ben and the Broadside crew are in a wildly different time zone from me. Um, so in order to organise this, um, I've pre-recorded uh, a set of questions and Ben's pre-recorded uh, a set of answers. And uh, I'm going to cut them together in this interview. Uh, hopefully you, you shouldn't see the joy, it'll be smooth as silk. Um, but so first of all, I'll open up with uh, one of the fairly standard uh, questions for this sort of interview. Um, so first of all, Ben, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, what got you into miniatures gaming and specifically maybe what led you to go from being a gamer over to uh, a games designer? Ben. Good day, Glenn. Hey, how you doing? Um, yeah, thanks for asking me on. Uh, it's good to be here. Cheers. 
Uh, okay, so how did I get into gaming? All right, well, um, I started off uh, working in a gaming store. Um, it was a bit different. Uh, my background at that stage was Blood Bowl, Space Hulk, and um, Dungeons and Dragons, um, Dragonlance at that stage. I was also into the Iron Crown version of uh, Lord of the Rings, which is a Lord of the Rings card game. It's probably like three card games for Lord of the Rings old. Um, but uh, the gaming store I was working in was uh, very, very different to my background and experience. So there was a lot of uh, no-color gaming rule sets like uh, DBA, um, a lot of historical stuff. They were selling mostly ancients, mostly Napoleonics, um, some World War II, which I found very interesting, but mostly 15 mil, which is a scale that I was unfamiliar with. Um, so what I found was that I was really good at, um, even though I didn't know these game systems, I was really good at breaking them down and finding the game within the game. So Magic the Gathering, for example, what I mean by the game within the game uh, is that Magic the Gathering, for example, is it's two wizards fighting on extra planar realm and they summon forth uh, heroes and warriors to, to fight for them, you know, and beasts and creatures and dragons and all those sorts of things. And they also cast spells and all that sort of stuff. So when you're selling it to someone, that's what you say, it's a wizard battle. But the actual game is simply if you can draw cards faster than your opponent, if you can uh, make all your creatures, for example, have haste so that they don't suffer summoning sickness, if you can reduce the cost of your cards as opposed to increase the cost of your opponent's cards, then you're going to win because that's the essence of the actual game itself. Blood Bowl, for example, if you can roll the dice less than your opponent, um, then you're going to win because the more you roll the dice, you only roll the dice when you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing in Blood Bowl. Um, there's always a chance, even with the strongest creature on the weakest creature, that you're going to roll uh, double skulls. Um, so, yeah, with Blood Bowl, it's simply stay out of your opponent's tackle zone, and they then only get one blitz on your whole your whole team. If you put your whole team in base-to-base -base contact with your opponent, and they have a turn in base-to-base -base contact with your players, then they're going to have a hit at all of your players, whereas if you keep your players out of their tackle zones, then they just have the one hit, which is a blitz. Um, and you want to get the ball to the other end of the field without passing uh, or stepping um, you know, as much as possible or try and minimize those things. And you always want to try and catch the ball with the player who has catch, and you want to throw the ball with the player who has throw. I know this is sort of elemental stuff, but it's breaking down the essence of the game. Um, Space Hulk, it's all about uh, area control and overwatch. If you don't want to spend your actions, you want to spend actions during the uh, alien's turn. Um, you want the aliens to trigger your overwatch and have your guy shoot for free. Um, and you want to save actions to uh, clear the gun jams on your your um, marines. Uh, that's So that's the essence of game. So I found that I was really, really good at um, getting to the core of the experience of the game, so I was able to sell people on the games that way. Um, when did I start uh, writing rules and things? Well, that, that was easy. When Micro, uh, Micro Machines released um, the Micro Machine Star Trek ships. I wrote a fleet battles game for Star Trek using um, the miniatures, um, and a lot of that went into broadside. Um, it was tons of fun. It was a game that, that other that people who weren't necessarily gamers can play because it was one of those closed environments. Space Hulk is a closed environment. It's not trying to bring anything uh, into the game that isn't in the Aliens movie. Um, Blood Bowl's the same. It's not well. Sometimes with magic and and traps and and dungeon bowl and things like that, it's it's trying to be other things. Um, but yeah, so it was a closed environment, so therefore the rules can be really really tight. They don't have to say more than they have to say, and the game doesn't have to be about things that aren't weapon systems and movement. Uh, in the case of um, the Star Trek game, I had shields. Uh, and cloaking devices, but that was pretty much it as far as special rules was, con was concerned. And, and you know, if you can add elements to the game like cards and tokens and things like that, then you can take um, the necessity to, to to write things down with a pen and paper out of the game. Um, and that's one of the things I, I found really hard to take with the Middle Earth um, 
tabletop miniatures game there was a lot of pen and paper stuff um, that's common to a lot of um, black and white rule books you know you know I mean DBA is a black and white rule book it, it, did, it only recently started having colored covers um, and that's what we're trying to avoid with broadside um, introducing elements like cards and tokens um, but not too many of them I mean uh, I love fantasy flight I, I love um, uh, descent journeys in the dark second edition it, it's um, it's very very clever but you know when they went into Star Wars Armada it turned me right off because there was just too much there were these little turny thing, turn token things and then you had to stack them and then there's chits and then there's tokens and then there's ship miniatures and there's cards and there's small cards and there's big cards and there's medium sized cards and it just got too much there were too many elements um, uh, a long time ago there was a, a group of podcasters called the WWPD what would Patton do and they nailed it that the, the, you spend more time setting up and packing up of a game of X-Wing than you do playing it um, despite the miniatures being gorgeous, and there's many elements in that game that are fantastic. Uh, okay, so yeah, so how did I get into rules writing? Well, I did the same thing everyone else does, and you simply just um, you start off by modifying the game that you're playing, don't you? You you add campaign settings for it, you change the rule here, you change the rule there, you you bring in uh, different elements. Um, uh, I didn't really start writing rules until I wrote my own World War II game based around Italy. I liked Italy because it was a, a closed environment again. You've got, um, there's not that huge technology shift like there is in early war um, and late war. Late war gets crazy. So there was a, a, a real closed environment in Italy, you know, sort of the Panzer IV and the Sturmgeschultz were pretty much all you had to worry about with, uh, you know, the Marder. Uh, and the exotic stuff was elephants, but there weren't that many of them. And the, the British and Americans are pushing around in Shermans most of the time. So it was a, a really easy set of rules to write because you were dealing with the 6x4 and, you know, sort of not so many elements, not like late war where there's, there's all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff going on. Um, but of course, Flames of War came out and um, I started playing Flames of War. So in order to uh, get people to play Flames of War in my local community instead of having them buy full armies uh, we went down to the game shop and we modified Flames of War to be 500 points tanks only and we divided a 6x4 into into two so we could then you know have more players and we were giving stuff away so we were buying um, tank boxes and, and painting you know sort of a, a half dozen tanks up and giving them away as prize support so we had a, a set of 500 point rules we rewrote all the missions um yeah i then went on to do a solo play um game for tanks um which is a battlefronts um now what's called world of tanks but it was their sort of um yeah sort of tank on tank engagement really small stuff um yeah, still a great game. And I, I went and wrote a solo play for that, which was essentially a comic book which had a story. So you'd read the story and then you'd go play the solo mission. I had tons of fun writing that. That was good. Um, yeah, and then my first sort of serious attempt at um, getting my friends to play something that um, I was really serious about was a set of Napoleonic Age of Sail rules because I'm a huge fan of Blytho and uh, Aubrey Maturin. Um But of course, you it's, it's a stuffy period of history because you can't sail in certain directions and people just couldn't wrap, wrap their heads around the fact that their ship was eventually going to be pushed into the rocks because that's just the the nature of where they put their ship it was it was an impossible mission to get the ship to sail into the wind so yeah my friends hated it <laughs> as, as beautiful as the miniatures were um, and there's some great stuff you you can get for the Napoleon Age of Sail but yeah a bit of that went into um into broadside as well yeah yeah so that's um that's that's my background um yeah sorry for the long-winded answer and if you had to pick uh just a single game to be your uh sort of inspiration in getting started or just more generally uh in game design uh what would that be inspirational games uh well i mean you can't go past aliens the movie for one of the greatest movies ever ever made uh, it's essentially all of that uh, Vietnam War stuff uh, boiled down into a science fiction setting. Fantastic acting. Um, yeah, just great. 
I mean, it was a movie we watched as kids over and over and over again. A uh, big fan. So, of course, when Space Hulk came out, I recognized it instantly as, as simply Aliens, the movie on a board game that they weren't prepared to pay for the IP for. Um, so I've pulled all the miniatures out of the game and I use the Protoss a uh, Aliens and the Protoss Colonial Marines, but I still play Space Hulk because it's so clever. Uh, it's a tiny set of rules, it's got components, um, and it's essentially, uh, as I said before, it's the game of Overwatch. You've got to, you've got to use your opponent's turn to win. So for the for the aliens player, you've essentially got to find a place where your aliens can amass and then attack just a single marine. And the and the great thing about that is that you've your opponents set their defense. They've set their Overwatch. Um, to allow them to move the objective uh, or to move their troops through they have to block corridors off uh, with overwatch troops and the whole idea is you then amass your aliens so you can charge down the corridor at Hudson and eat him uh, and then once you've undone your opponent's defense then you can just go into the squishy center with with all your claws and, and your, your teeth and eat your way to to victory uh, of all these unsuspecting marines who have their backs turned to you um, it's just it's so much fun the the element of the egg timer to make your opponent uh set uh, their defense before you go on the offensive just genius uh but just simple elements um simple elements but i mean the, the board itself looks beautiful now that the latest edition of the board's gorgeous uh yeah beautiful set of rules again runs from the back cover of the rule book um so yeah the concept of actions uh, small unit action that actually works. There's a lot of small unit actions that, that they're trying to do too much. Space Hulk does exactly what it needs to do. Uh, it's great. Yeah, I love that one. Uh, the game that's most influential on Mord Ga my game, Broadside Empires of Steel, is uh, Wings of Glory. Uh, it got called Wings of War before the IP got sold to um, Fantasy Flight for their X-Wing version of the game. Don't play that. It, you know, my, my recommendation is you go back to Wings of Glory. Uh, it's a small number of elements for what is such a fun game. There's drama. Um, my wife and my kid play it. We, we go to dinner parties and play with uh, with friends who don't play games or role play or play card games, and they they f they find the fun in it very 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 quickly. Um, and there's a lot of fun in making mistakes, and you can do that um, in Wings of Glory and have hilarious results. Uh, there's drama in the damage deck um, as well, you know, the, the elements that um, your pilot gets wounded and there's smoke and all those sorts of things, and it's all straight out of a damage deck. They're so simple, simple components for what is such an entertaining game. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of that in, in Broadside as well. Yeah, I, if, if I had to pick two games that's that's definitely it i mean yeah yeah if you haven't played them you should definitely purchase them and give them a go um there's a lot of cleverness as well in um descent journeys in the dark uh second edition that if you can grab yourself a copy of that you should do it um it's definitely the best version of dungeons and dragons uh if you're not playing an actual version of dungeons and Dungeons and Dragons, excuse me. Um, one of the things that they did with that was they introduced an iPad to be the GM. Um, they left the actual miniature movement and the battling to the players to control the enemy min minions, um, but they do surprising things, um, and that's controlled by the iPad as well. Um, so that was really, really clever. It's again that concept that you, your character sheet is, or your, you know, whatever you're playing, is a card sitting in front of you, and you manipulate that card, and you add dice to it, and you add chits to it, um, and you can see at a glance how your character's doing. Um, that's definitely in broadside. Um, yeah, it's it's the whole idea of just you you can play the whole game from the back of the back cover of the book and what's on table. Yeah, those sorts of games really uh, I love and yeah they've had a, a really heavy influence on our game. So uh, I've talked through my sort of uh, vision of of what Broadside seems to be, um, but that's you know that that that's not as sort of <laughs> obviously as deep as your own. Could you give us an overview uh, in your own words of, of Broadside and what it is? Yeah, uh, so an overview of Broadside. Um, 
uh, well, Broadside is essentially a game of big, big wet tanks. Um, but it's more than that. One of the games that, that I just love playing that's um, ancient was the old Mech Warriors. And the concept that you have this big mecha robot that goes around blowing things up, but at the same time, it gets nibbled to death. You don't get sort of alpha striked where you're either on the table or you're not. Um, Broadside has that that element. So you've got these massive steel citadel, uh, citadels um, uh, essentially loaded with artillery and they sail around, sail around the table um, if they can uh, nail a smaller ship, then they'll nail it, but it's it's not easy to do because they're often too fast. Um, so yeah, so the the basic element of it is is is, is gigantic uh, citadels of steel nibbling each other to death. Um, it's also rock paper scissors. Um, so yeah, getting to the the main design elements of, of of the game, like I was saying with the other games, ours is simply um, rock paper scissors, which is the element you know, of uh, pretty much most games. I'm just going to change the picture in picture so you can see some, something. Okay, sorry about the blur blurriness of the other camera. Uh, I don't know. You set it to autofocus and this is what happens. Yep, yeah, well, technology. Um, okay, so we've got a battleship, we've got an armoured cruiser, we've got a light cruiser, and we've got a destroyer that are coming in and out of focus for some reason. Um, so in the world of rock, paper, scissors, the destroyer destroys the battleship. Okay, because there's a brand new technology that's just come out, which is the nuclear weapon of the era, you know, nuclear weapon of the era, and that's the torpedo. And the torpedo sinks battleships. Okay, so you've got the rock, paper, scissors element. But, of course, the torpedo boat is extremely fragile. Um, and what hunts and kills the torpedo boats, uh, or, does, you know, destroyers, is the light cruiser. The light cruiser is the killer of the, the uh, destroyer. So what do you kill light cruisers with? You cru you kill them with armoured cruisers because they've got the armour and the hits to survive attacks from light cruisers. Now all three of these have torpedoes as well, but it's all about speed. So the speed of the torpedo um, and, and how quickly you can get the torpedoes to the capital ships. Now the capital ships, their job is to nibble down either on what would be battle cruisers or armored cruisers sitting in this rock paper scissors zone um, so you know you have when it comes to armored cruisers you have some armored cruisers that are a bit like battleships so they perform the same role as the battleship which is essentially your artillery so this is the game because most of the points in the game are sitting in your battleships um, and these guys get involved in duels with other battleships um, and everyone else, uh, these two rock, paper, scissor elements, keeps the battleship safe while it's doing these artillery duels from torpedo attacks. Now, light cruisers, in, you know, the more expensive light cruisers have some elements of, of um, destroyers as well. So they have a high speed and they also have uh, torpedoes, but it's really only the torpedo boat destroyers that can actually deliver the... the uh, the one-shot kill on, on battleships. So the game is rock, paper, scissors. It's, it's, um, you've got uh, artillery uh, killing um, armor cruisers and, and battle cruisers. Uh, armor cruisers and battle cruisers get into the middle of the table and destroy light cruisers to make way for your attack of torpedo boats. In the meantime, you're screening your capital ships with light cruisers to, to intercept and destroy your opponent's um, destroyers and that, that's it it's just it's rock paper scissors um, you know there's also other fun things that, that, that are involved in the game as well so we've got aircraft um, we've got zeppelins um, we've got aircraft carriers this is furious you see there can you see there yep there is a fighter being launched and she's got a ridiculous gun on the back Yep, let's flip this over. That's a, that's a Yamato size gun. Um, we've got other stuff that's a bit of fun as well. So we've got wolves in sheep's clothing. So these are uh, cruise liners that have been converted to have guns and torpedoes. Uh, we have special rules for those as well, so that they they look innocent on table until you examine them. A lot like um, R2D2 and C3PO in um, 
uh, in Legion, you, you can't shoot at them because they're innocent droids unless you've identified them. Once you come within range where you can identify that this actually got torpedoes and guns, then you can shoot at it. Um, yeah, you know, we've also got some other special stuff as well. Yeah, some of the mission, some of the uh, missions have things like this, which is of course the ti the sister ship to the Titanic. She is the Britannic. She was um, sunk during World War One. But um, yeah, so we've got some other cool stuff. We've got forts. Um, this is an Ottoman fort. You can see the guns on it quite clearly, uh, and it has a damage deck that's unique to it. So you don't know. Uh, if you've killed this fort because it has its own unique da damage deck and that information is secret. So each time you bring your guns to, uh, to bear on the fort, it does a damage card which your opponent will look at and then put face down next to the fort. And you basically just have to guess whether or not you've killed it enough to get points. Um, so just like all the games I spoke of that um, I really admired, our game uses uh, a character sheet <laughs> essentially and this is how you uh, find out what weapons the ship you've you've got in your fleet has it also tells you how fast it's going and how much health it's got left um, this these are printed for free directly from our army builder online army builder um, so once you've picked a fleet then the cards come out of your printer you have, that's what this is a piece of paper it's not a it's not a um, company printed one um, and we do this so we can um, curate points and you know um, fix exploits so we do all of these things um, uh, at our expense and so you can have all these cards for free um, because yeah we've had you know sort of war machine hordes we've learnt the, the lesson from them that they brought out a whole bunch of cards I mean uh, even uh, so a Song of Ice and Fire have, have, have come a cropper with their cards and things like that, so it's, it's better not to sell them, in our opinion, it's just better to have them sitting online, you can have them for free. Okay, so other elements that make our game quick to play over the uh, stuffier World War uh, 1 and 2 naval games. So we've got a damage deck that has all the character in it, so all the drama, so you can flood, you can catch, your ship can flood, it can catch fire, you can lose guns, um, it can be so complicated that um, uh, the, the damage to your ship can complicate uh, your execution of orders. Um, okay, so the basic element of, of the game is that, that it's completely fair. So we have an algorithm that calculates the points of each ship. So you're paying, each ship is paying simply for its raw stats. Um, but uh, the, the game is played between two players because you know, there, we've got 600 points each in our fleets, for example. Um, so that is a fair game because the the ships are all points balanced. How you win, because there is no unfair advantage to one player or the other, um, is orders. So you have orders that you play on your ship each turn, um, and they turn uh, your ship into a superpower. So your ship can only move six inches for example you give it the more speed uh, option it can go seven inches so it's breaking its design parameters um, there are other orders you can give that uh, allow you to fire torpedoes um, that improve your shooting ability and um, so yeah so that the essence of the game is how you execute your orders for your ships um, and you give them a superpower and then that breaks that points deadlock and makes the game about you and me and the decisions that we make on table rather than um, what you've chosen for your fleet. Um, so if you are shooting at my ship, it becomes uh, harder for me to execute my orders. If you've damaged my ship, it, it's harder for me to execute the orders on that ship. So the orders turn your ship into a super, a super uh, ship um, that's outperforming its points um, and so if you you bring your weight of fire on the ships that are crucial to your opponent's strategy at the time and you try and try to add as many complications you know um, flooding or um, fires and all these sorts of things all make it harder for you to get your order to work which means your ship will be a plane uh, salt and uh, uh, salt flavor rather than salt and vinegar or barbecue or chili. It's just going to be a plain 
sea salt flavored ship and it will perform um, exactly as the points say it performs whereas um, if you put an order on it it suddenly has supercharging or it becomes just better at what it uh, what it's rock paper scissors assigned role is and so that's the essence of the game so it's um yeah it's orders that make that difference uh, so here's our rule book it's um 17 pages deep so that's uh you should be able to to gnaw your way through that pretty quickly um it's also it's got this stuff on the side of it so if you do have to go into the into the rules oops, sorry uh, you'll find the rules you're particularly looking for in big letters down the sides of the page. Okay, so this isn't the kind of rule book that you would get from, um, say, Battlefront, where there's a lot of a lot of really cool stuff to read and history in there. It's just how to play the game. Okay, just like the other games I admire, our game runs off the back page, so you don't need to go in to the the rule book to to play the game. Um, it's it's all the tables for playing the game uh, are on the back page and this is just simply fire and damage um, there you go um, so the speed of the ship uh, is what your, your speed you're, you're traveling at that's at inches so you move your ship uh, you turn your ship using our um, movement tool uh, and then you fire the ship's guns so oh it's uh, your turn and then my turn so it's alternate activation so you're not waiting around for your opponent to decide what they're going to do with every single ship um, and the game goes for six turns and it's simply it doesn't matter what the mission is and there are lots of missions and they're all free uh, downloads from our download section on our webpage broadside empires of steel dot com um, but all of the results are the same it's just down to tonnage sunk so if you reduce your opponent ships to with its, uh, to 50% of their hull value um, then you get half their points if you sink them then you get all of their points and the game goes for six turns and it's who sinks the most points uh, for the, the duration of the game and as I say the missions uh, change everything but uh, they don't change the points sometimes there are bonus points to be had on table in a mission and all that does is just add points to your potential points that you accrue for victory um, I hope I've explained that okay. So one of the things I think is really interesting from your current Kickstarter is that you've really taken advantage of uh, modern digital delivery methods. Um, you've got SDL ships and uh, PDF sets of rules. And I'd just like to say, take a second and say, I, I really love um, your uh, online shipyards shipbuilding program. It's really sort of smart and easy to use. I've had a sort of quick go on it. Um, how do you think that digital delivery has freed up independent designers, uh, if you think it has, um, um, and do you think that being particularly based in Australia, being freed up from shipping, shipping concerns is uh, additionally and specifically important for you? Yeah, uh, so digital delivery. Wow. Um, there was no option. So my if I want to buy an actual physical miniature, I have to travel to Bathurst to my local gaming store. Um, and that's on the other side of the mountains or I can travel for 45 minutes down the mountains to another gaming store um, so competing in Australia with all of the stuff that's available with the, on the internet is really hard so gaming stores here are doing it tough but you know they're hanging in there um, just for perspective Australia is the same size as, as the USA but we have about the same population as New York City that's spread over the entire country um, so we have on the east coast where I'm at, uh, we have three major tournaments. We have um, Moab, mother of all battles, and that's in the Sutherland Shire, south of Sydney. Um, when we're going, we're going there this October. We're going to have a hotel because it's just that far to travel. Um, at uh, Easter time uh, in Brisbane, there is BrizCon. Um, that's great. Beautiful people. Queensland is a uh, tons of fun friendly much more friendly than New South Wales people um, so yeah but that's that's a, an hour and a half by aircraft or 12 and a half hours by car and then the next major event and the big one for the southern hemisphere it's the biggest one in the southern hemisphere is Cancon and that's in Canberra that's three and a half hours drive from here um, that's one to two to three thousand people playing games and about twenty to thirty thousand worth of visitors to the retail spaces and it takes place in three aircraft hangars with two side buildings as well 
Um, and that's tons of fun. That's CanCon. So if you're ever visiting Australia, you want to visit an Australia Day long weekend, which is in January, and, and go see CanCon. Um, so yeah, so <laughs> long story short, right? Uh, digital delivery, it was the only way to make a game for us. So we once 3D printers became available, I mean, all the... All, all, the, I was ever planning on doing if I was going to ever publish rules was put them up on War Games Vault. Um, but 3D printers changed everything, and uh, Andrew was de designing ships for uh, that uh, Warlord game, the World War Two one with Coastal Craft. Name escapes me. Sorry. Um, yeah, that's the one. Um, yeah, that game. Uh, he was designing miniatures for that because he wasn't happy with their release schedule. He was doing it himself. Uh, so I, I created rules. Um, he creates the miniatures. Um, and it worked out really, really well. So we decided to use the uh, SDL technology and the PDF technology to get things into the hands of people who would pay between 40 and $60 dues to get their hands on it if we made it. And... You know we can't make it here for anything any cheaper than what they can make it for in China, and none of that sort of manufacturing is is here in Australia anyway. Um, so it's just a too hard basket. It's just a whole lot easier to provide everything in SDL. So we do Kickstarters and we provide everything in SDLs and PDFs. Um, we have recently got over that hurdle by building a print farm here at the um, at the studio so we have an online um, list building uh, web page app I guess you could call it everything's an app these days um, and uh, you go there it's the same one that um, you'll go to for Star Wars Legion made by the same guy um, in Seattle good bloke named Andrew um, yeah, so you go there, you you choose your nation, and you build your fleet. There's videos on our webpage where you, you can see how to do this. Um, you create an account, and you can build a fleet, and then you can just press order and order the ships. We print them here, put them in a box, and send them to you. Um, and then all our accessories and components are available on eBay. And yes, you do pay Australian um, prices for those. It's just unavoidable. Yeah, it's just the, the nature of the fact that we're on the other side of the planet to pretty much everyone else. Um, yep, and that's sort of how we have to do it until we can find ourselves a, a manufacturer um, who can do things the way we want them done, which is the right way. <laughs> um, I am well. We are a big fan of clever user interface bits uh, on the channel. Um, I particularly love the the little um, ship straddling hoops that you've designed uh, for aircraft in Broadside. Um, which little bit, gadget, item, or just reference sheet for helping people to play the game is your particular favourite? Yeah. So Broadside has um, lots of little uh, things, lots of tokens, a little bit of cards. Um, that go with it, but um, one of the things that we do have that makes things a whole lot quicker um, is this tool here, which is our turning tool. Sorry again about the weird camera work, but when you've got um, a ship, rather than have a whole bunch of different uh, rulers and all those sorts of things, um, we have this which has all the turning arcs already on it. So you just, if in order to turn your ship, I just have to stand up, sorry. Uh, so, for example, you want to turn your ship 30 degrees, you line that up with the green line, and then use the elbow. That's one gadget. Yes, as you said, uh, well, um, this little flight stand gadget we've got for the for the bombing, when uh, this Zeppelin's going to attack a ship, um, we can put that over the top of any mast in the game. It's designed so that uh, you can show that this ship is attacking. Sorry, this aircraft is attacking this ship. Um, there's no confusion about where it where it is with round stands. It's right over the top of the ship you're attacking. And yeah, that's a it's a horseshoe flight stand that's designed by by us as well. Um, fun things. This token that's a minefield token. If you see that token, it means that your ship has fallen into the enemy's trap. Um, this one is a pretty important one for the game. I'll turn it around so you can see it properly. Um, so there are four of these in the game. All right. So it's a splash marker or an aiming token. Um, you put this when you are trying to shoot your artillery um, from your main directed guns 
onto an enemy ship. If you miss, you add this to your enemy ship. All right, you keep one, so this one says C, so let's say this is HMS Colossus. You have one of those on your card, and then you add one here. And that makes this ship one easier to hit next turn from HMS Colossus. Because that's essentially how they're doing this. They're watching from a, an observation point for the, the fall of shot. Um, and in this case, it'd be splashes or fire and smoke. Um, so yeah, so you put these, if I miss once, it goes there. If I miss again, I get another one. And um, of course, this ship, if, if it chooses to, can take evasive action and shake uh, these, uh, essentially, these target locks um, by taking evasive action. Smaller ships can don't have to take evasive action because they turn um, so well. They can simply choose to turn a lot more than they usually would, and when they do that, they shake this target lock. It's all in the rules. Um, but yeah, and more components that make the game easier instead of having to remember which ship you're shooting at. Now, one thing that, that happened... Um, in one of the battles, I'm just going to go back to the other camera. There we go. One thing that happened in, in the battles between the, uh, the the German Navy and the Royal Navy um, was that Tiger was shooting at um, a, a ship that another British ship was shooting at. So we have two British ships shooting at one German ship, and one of the British ships was completely confused by the splashes from the other ship. So those aiming tokens also add us to make it harder for you to hit the enemy ship because one of your other ships is shooting at that ship. Um, so it's confusing both rangefinders because there's so many splashes arriving at, at strange times, um, it's actually not helping anybody. So, um, yeah, you, you basically have to l shoot major ship to major ship um, unless there's no choice. So we do have um, a set of upgrade cards that you can upgrade that to get over that problem but um, yeah that's what an example of so obviously we covered a lot of the game uh, mechanics and elements but if there's one thing um in short what is the thing that you're most proud of uh, about broadside so the thing I am most um, proud of about broadside um, well I just love the detail level that Andrew's been able to achieve with our minis um, yeah, uh, they look great. Hang on, I'll change back to this camera and we'll see if we can get them to work. There we go. I mean, there is my thumb. There is the ship. Uh, so, there's not much detail that, that uh, Andrew's not able to cram into these gorgeous miniatures. Um, a lot of naval games they have to make the compromise on scale because uh, there's a, a static that they're hoping to achieve and, and when they do that then you, you really do end up with um, come on focus there we go with making compromises that I, th I think people are not prepared to to, uh, to live with you really want to walk up to a table and go that is absolutely gorgeous it's spectacle isn't it I mean if you're going to spend all the time painting these things you they really need to reward you for your efforts um yep yeah there we go uh and we're achieving these results in plastic rather than you know now don't get me wrong ghqs make some beautiful miniatures they, but um materials like you know lead are going to be harder and harder to come by um whereas this stuff is yeah, it's just quite an expensive. So we can we can do our miniatures for for, for a fraction of the price that um, uh, other companies can do when they're building in other materials. And we make no compromise at all on on quality. And that's the reason why we've chosen this scale um, because you can have these battleships, uh, <laughs> you know, with that level of detail. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and uh, anything else you'd like people to know about the game or your current Kickstarter that's running at the moment? Yeah, look, thanks very much for having me on. Um, yeah, so last words, uh, we have a Kickstarter running at the moment. It's called Liberté. 
it's on Kickstarter. Search for Broadside Empires of Steel or just Broadside and it will come up. Um, and we are adding, or have added, the um, thanks to the community, they've already, the Kickstarter is already fully funded. All we're doing is now unlocking uh, extra ships. So we have the French and the Ottoman navies now. So that's nine ocean-going uh, navies that were competing in the Great War. Um, that's all of them. They're all there now. Um, yeah, uh, so if you would like to get a uh, STLs and the, the PDFs to, to play Broadside Empires of Steel, Kickstarter Liberté. Thank you, Glenn, for having me on. It's um, Yeah, it's been a bit of fun having a chat. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you so much to Ben for, for doing that for us. I know it's a little bit sort of funny the way that we did the interview, um, broken up into pieces of response back and forth, but I think it, it, it sort of uh, it went together fairly well. Um, hopefully um, you've all sort of gotten a deeper insight into the game. I genuinely think it's got so many start, uh, sort of smart mechanics. For me, um, maybe slightly ironically uh it's sort of bringing the sort of the, the naval war game into a sort of more modern era of gaming we hear a lot of the time sort of modern sort of gaming sensibilities um and i think some of the slightly more niche areas maybe sort of haven't locked into all of those and so i think it's super exciting to see something like broadsides which is really sort of um working in a lot of the sort of faster moving um more sort of tactically interesting more sort of game based elements but still keeping the sort of the the good things the the the, the fun things exciting things about um historic naval gaming um if you are in any way interested uh in broadside and i'd say more to the point if you're interested in some unusual approaches to some unique game design challenges um, you should totally give Broadside a, a look over, check out the current Kickstarter, um, you know, check out the website, because I think sometimes we, we get locked into a standard set of solutions uh, for, for game design um, and to sort of look at a different area, an area that sort of forces certain challenges on you and seeing how someone has solved those challenges. And I think Broadside has just solved so many of those challenges so incredibly well. Well worth checking out, looking over um, for, for inspiration, for a drive to maybe sort of try out designing a little bit outside of your comfort zone or hopefully driving you to sort of try out an area of gaming that you might have sort of passed over before. But yeah, definitely check over Broadside, uh, Broadside give it a look over, check out the Kickstarter, uh, uh, and I strongly suggest trying it out, playing the game. Super cool set of mechanics, really cool game. And so again, thank you so much to Ben for doing this. Um, I hope you enjoyed um, this review and interview for uh, Broadside. So uh, thanks for watching. And from me, from this particular review and interview, it's going to be a thank you and goodbye. So thank you and goodbye. Bye bye. <laughs>